Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Spirit of Grace. I'm Pastor Ted, and I'm glad that you are here with us today. I'm glad you're here with us for a lot of reasons, but most of all, because this is a good day to celebrate. Mother's Day, that's a significant thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're celebrating graduation, and many of you are here as as guests today as we celebrate uh, graduation, and so we welcome you among us. Thank you for being here and being here in worship today. And also, we are wrapping up a message series called In the Ring, where we're kind of imagining and using the image of uh, a boxing match to talk about relationships. And in this, we have this idea that when you're in a boxing match, that you know, ideally, I guess, the, the idea is that you, you want to kind of get it over with as quickly as you can. So in a boxing match, that, that you're going to try to knock your opponent out. But of course, just like you've been training, so has the other guy or gal. And so sometimes the fight keeps going on in two or three minute rounds for nine, 10, 11, even 12 rounds. And depending on the boxing federation, uh, that full, say 10 or 12 rounds of boxing, that if you make it all the way into that and both fighters are still standing, then the decision is called by the judges. But we call that going the distance. Going the distance because Life today means you're going to take punches. Life today means you're going to run into problems and challenges. And the question is not whether we will face suffering in our lives. The question is when and how we will deal with it. And so today we're talking about the endurance of relationships. And we're beginning with the idea of suffering. Now, I want to be entirely clear up front that as a concept, I'm against the idea of suffering. I've tried it. I don't enjoy it much. Uh, it's something I'd rather do without. If we could pass a law banning suffering, I would do my best to, to lobby for that to get it through. The problem with suffering, though, is that it seems to be woven into the fact of our universe. It seems to be woven into the nature of existence itself. And so, consequently, all of us are acquainted with the idea of suffering, some in big ways, some in small ways. Some in ways that are very obvious and public and open to, for everybody to see them, whether you like that or not. Others, which we keep quiet and we put a mask on and we face the public, we face the people around us, and they never know what's really going on inside. All of us know what suffering is like. And it's not something that we deal with well in our culture. Our culture wants to say things like, God won't give you anything you can't handle. Nonsense. God, our culture wants to say things like, the suffering that we face is something that, because of something we did or didn't do. That's nonsense too. Our culture wants to say a lot of different things, and they tend to say these things in the name of Christianity or in the name of Jesus. They want us to believe that suffering is something that proves that there's something wrong with you or that suffering is something that you can't avoid and it's something that you should find despairing. So today we're talking about suffering, but we have to draw some clear lines here in order to understand suffering from, a, uh, from uh, the perspective of the rest of the world, from the perspective of American culture, and suffering from the perspective of Christianity. Now, one of the things that comes along with that is the uncomfortable realization that this country no longer, in terms of its lived out values, can really say that it's a Christian country anymore. I'm not, you know, we can have an argument about that later if you want to have an argument about it, and that's okay. And, and it doesn't really matter, though, what f values it was founded on. If you just go around and you ask people what their values are, you watch them, you see what they do with their time, you see what they do with their checkbook, uh, you do, you know, you see the way that they interact with their neighbors. It's very difficult to come to any other conclusion except that Christianity is no longer the dominant story in our culture. I don't think it's something we should, as Christians, be threatened by, but I think it's a real thing we have to come to grips with. Instead, the culture around us lives by a set of values with a fancy name, but they're actually pretty simple and easy to understand. The fancy name, see, it's graduation weekend, so I feel, felt like if you came to church, you had to learn something. Okay, and a fancy name, and some of you have heard me say this before, it's called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. 
How's that for some 25 cent words? That and three more dollars will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. But moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic because it's, it says that God cares about whether you are moral. Okay, God wants you to be a moral person. But our standard for moral is always relative to ourselves. So in other words, God's really cool with whatever I do. It's the other people who are the problem. Therapeutic because it says that the primary purpose of God in our lives is to be focused on making me feel better. So suffering is a bad thing. And suffering never has any value. And the number one thing God can do for me is take away my suffering as soon as possible. And deism, because it's not Christianity, it doesn't believe anything about Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God. But what it does believe is that there is some sort of a God who created the universe and, generally speaking, wound it up and, and then God walked away. God is not interested in a personal, ongoing relationship with us. These are the dominant stories in our culture today. And these are in no way compatible with any variation. This isn't just like Lutheran Christians or something like that. There's no variation of Christianity which can square up with those values whatsoever. Moralistic therapeutic deism is not Christianity. Let's, let's acknowledge that. And so we see this really raises its head when we start talking about things like suffering because our world's values look at suffering and their first reaction is that suffering is evil and wrong and we need to get rid of it. We need to ban suffering. I am against suffering. I don't like suffering. I don't want to see people suffer. I really don't like seeing myself suffer. One of the most uncomfortable things for me is watching myself suffer. It's awful. And our world says, you know what? The faster we can get rid of human suffering, the better off we will be. In fact, we will become enlightened super people who can do whatever we want to do, and we don't have anything to hold us back anymore. To get rid of suffering is a, is a, is a positive good without equal. And so we live instead in the world by the values of utilitarianism, which is another fancy way of saying that whatever seems to work the best, we should do that. And we don't ever express it in the term, well, that's utilitarianism. That's not Christianity. We don't use terms like that, but we live by this stuff. So we say, what is it that maximizes my pleasure and minimizes my pain and discomfort? You know, I've got $3,000 in a bank account. Am I going to the Bahamas or am I going to Cancun? You know, whatever maxim what's going to maximize my pleasure and minimize my pain? Giving that charitably is not something that often crosses our mind. Wow, I got $3,000? I can give that to charity. Some of you do that. God bless you. But most of us, that's not our first reaction. My first reaction is, let's kill the student debt. Because, you know, I got me to think about. Or we run into this when we talk about uh, other kinds of things. Where, you know, where, wherever we're trying to find ways to minimize our pain and, and maximize our pleasure, to make things as happy, safe, comfortable, and predictable as possible. That is when we're living by utilitarianism. And we would say, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else that we can tell, What's it to you to say anything about it? I mean, what is it to you after all? Are, are you your brother's keeper? The funny thing is that the answer to that question was supposed to be yes in the Bible. But we live by those values. That's how we think of the world. And Christianity runs right up against that. Christianity runs right up against utilitarianism. It runs right up against moralistic therapeutic deism. Watchmaker God who winds up the universe and is waiting for your phone call so he can make you feel better about something. That's just not the God of the Bible. So consequently, we have to relate to the bad things that happen in our lives, the true things that are actually suffering. We're not, we don't believe in, in the Buddhist idea that suffering is actually an illusion. No, suffering is real. Suffering is something we struggle with. Suffering is not just an illusion. Suffering is, it has tangible reality, and it sucks. And it's not a good thing, and it rarely comes from good things. But we can also confidently say, that sometimes we can see good out of bad situations. As a Christian, it's not that we're seeking out dis discomfort, like, hey, you know what, I, what I'm going to do? Now that I became a Christian, I'm going to beat myself three times a day because suffering is a good thing, right? <sighs> I'm thinking Monty Python right now. You know, that, that's, not, that's not the idea. The idea here is that suffering is not something which cannot be used by God to bring about good. So consequently, as Christians, we would reject every false god. The false god of comfort, the false god of predictability, the false god of security, the false god of maintaining things the way that they are. 
because we ultimately want to maximize our pleasure. We want to minimize our pain. And when we see suffering, we want to run the other direction. Now, I lay all this out because I think it's important for us, both in the context of Mother's Day and in the context of, of graduations, but also in the context of what we've been talking about here at Spirit of Grace for the last couple of weeks, which is relationships. That our relationship to suffering has a lot to do with the long-term success of all of these endeavors. Because we have been, live now in a world that expects a quick fix and things to happen right away. I, I'm, I'm as guilty of this as everybody else is. I want things right now, and I want them perfect. There is nothing that gets me more torqued off than going to a fast food restaurant, which miraculously has produced exactly what I want to eat within three minutes of me asking for it, put it in containers in a bag, and accepted my money through a card with like a special magnetic code that identifies. Like, we live in the future, folks. But if they get fries instead of onion rings in that bag, I lose my mind. And I won't say which restaurant it is in this town that always, 100% of the time, screws something up with my order. But that shouldn't bother me as much as it does. <laughs> but it does because we expect the quick fix. We expect that things will always be continually getting better because most of us have been alive only in times where we live in a nation where things are getting better and better and better. Economically, this country has been on a very positive slope for decades economically for about 130 years and we've gotten used to it so we think that that's the way it ought to be we think this about relationships too we think this about a parenting we think of parenting is something that well you know yeah the first you know kid and, and the first year or two it's really kind of a struggle but then after that you're supposed to have figured it out right parents uh. what what's so funny you're supposed to have it all figured out and then it's just it's easier and as the kids get older they get more mature and responsible and they make more mature, responsible decisions, right? Right? What? And as they get more and more mature and responsible, you can trust them more not to get into trouble. Can't you? No? I like this graph because, by the way, I said, I'm gonna, you're going to learn something, so there are graphs. <laughs> I was like, well, how can I find graphs to put on the screen? Yeah, so parenting before kids, eh. after kids, things are wonderful, things are terrible. And I've talked to enough of you here that I know that this is how your lives go. Everything is fabulous. My kids are amazing. Everything is horrible. My kids are literally the devil. There's no in-between on that most of the time. Marriages work this way too. We imagine that marriage is this upward slope where things are continually getting a little bit better every day. That's adorable. That's just adorable. No, seriously, the number one thing that I talk to couples about in premarital counseling is I, you know, I put them through this, this online survey thing. They both answer the questions, and then the computer puts it together and says, okay, what do you think, where do you need to talk to them? They don't know what the other one said, or they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to take the test together. Oh, honey, we do everything together. Not that. And then it comes to me, and I go, oh, ho, ho, look at this. You know what the number one thing that I always, always have come up as something to, and it's not like if you fail the test, you can't get married. No, but it's just, it's marriage expectations. Because so many of us, and ladies, I'm not trying to pick on you, but it's more often women than men. But I think men have their own version of this. So many of us expect that things are just going to keep on getting better because we're in love. And, and I always get to be the one who bears the bad news and say, I have news for you. When you get married, literally everything gets worse. And that sounds like I'm anti-marriage, and I'm totally not anti-marriage. Marriage is the best thing that ever happened to me, pretty much, except Jesus and my kids. Like, that's those three. But when it comes right down to it, everything is amplified. Everything is cranked to 11 because, yeah, you found them annoying before, but now you are permanently bonded to them. And so it's like, oh, fabulous. You know, I always hated that you smacked your lips. Now I can never get away from it. And I'm not talking about Jennifer. She does not do that. She has way better table manners than I do. <laughs> Our children, that's another thing. But we imagine that things are going to get better, and they're going to continually get better. 
And, and part of us knows that that's unrealistic because we know that there are challenges and, and particular points and ages for kids, for example, parenting. Or we know that, that not everything is, is super easy all the time because things come up and things change. And we understand that in sort of a basic way. But bottom line, we expect that these things are going to maximize pleasure, minimize pain, and then that that's what they're good for. That the reason why we get married is because it makes us happy. That the reason why we have children, this is actually really insidious. The reason why we have children is to maximize our happiness. That's a dangerous idea. Because it's not about you. But there are a lot of parents who carry that idea, and they would never say it out loud because they know it's not really a good thing. But it's there. Don't you realize that your purpose is to make me feel better? And even if we wouldn't say that we're expecting God to do that, we can expect the people around us to. It's very easy to turn people into things. So let's talk about suffering. Let's talk about what it means to interact with suffering. Suffering is not always a bad thing. Sometimes suffering, I mean, suffering always feels bad. It's not necessarily always bad per se in and of itself. But the big thing about the suffering that we have to remember is that one way or another, we're going to find in our scripture lesson today that suffering can be a catalyst for something called character development. I put this on the screen, especially with Jennifer in mind. I told you, you were going to learn something at church today. We're learning chemistry now. I don't even like chemistry. I don't even know why we're talking about this. Chemistry is my least favorite science subject. But we're going to talk about this. So if you have reactants, you know, the stuff you're going to mix together in the test tube, and you want them to mix together and become products, sometimes you have to like heat it up a little bit, right? You, but if you can add something that has a catalyst effect, what it does is it makes that reaction easier. You don't have to put as much energy in it. Because what you have to do, okay, I really am going to geek out over this. Watch this. What you have to do is you have to put enough energy. You know, the reactants are like, doo -doo -doo -doo. you have to put energy in the system. And then when you put energy in the system and you get it up here, then it's like, oh, yeah, finally, we can like break loose of these bonds, make these bonds, and we make something new. Have a catalyst there. You don't need as much energy. It's not that the growth is automatic. It's not that character development happens without any effort on your part. But when we go through suffering, it is a catalyst for personal growth. It makes it so that it requires less activation energy on our part, less motivation, less willpower, less ability to say, I'm just going to gird up my loins and do what I'm supposed to do. Because whether we like it or not, a catalyst is being added to our lives. I think our high school graduates understand that. If you know the value of activation energy more than them, they have learned the difference between procrastination and action. But here's the thing, and I'm, I'm very, I'm very pro-education, I'm very pro-public education, but here's the thing. If we were to just insist that kids grow up following their parents around until they're old enough to help out on their own, Kids would learn things. Would they learn as much, as fast? Certainly not, but they would learn things. You know how I know that? Because the public school system and the public education movement in the United States and actually around the world is only like about 130, 140 years old, maybe 150. It hasn't been around that long. We're used to it because it came along with industrialization, which also was the thing that makes us feel like everything gets better all the time, which it doesn't. But prior to that, people knew stuff. There were smart people prior to public education. They, some of them had wealthy parents who sent them to school, and if you weren't wealthy, you just couldn't go to school. That's sad. It limited people's potential. But it wasn't that school itself created that. But we want them to grow faster, and we want them to learn more and be more well-rounded and more able to address many different things in life. In this economy that we live in, you've got to be able to do that. And so as a result... We want to push people into harder things to give them the extra activation energy necessary. And so we teach them the many, many more things by putting them through suffering. We call it school. Graduates, can I have an amen? <laughs> we want them to grow faster so that we put them through lectures and tests and late night cram sessions, which are not as productive as everybody tells you. And whether they liked it or not, they learned something because they had to work for it. 
And so they learned far more than they would have if they had not been engaged in the process of school. This is not a bad thing. This is a really good thing. Because whether they liked it or not, they learned. Whether it felt like, man, I just love every day I go to school. I go to school and I see all my friends and I take all my classes and I get all my A's and then I go home. If you're that kind of student or you were that kind of student, God bless you. You're awesome. But most people, that's not how we reacted to the world. Oh, I have to go to school again. I really don't want to get out of bed. Oh, I have to go to school again. A test today? I, I had no idea. Most of us don't have that reaction to school. But we understand in some way that even if we don't like it, even if it's not something we would have chosen for ourselves, that the choice that we make to be involved in the process of education, even if it feels like suffering to us, we will grow from. If you go to school and you study, you will learn something. It just happens. And so we understand that if you get, do the hard work and you suffer and you stay up late and you work hard and you write papers and do all this stuff that you don't really want to do, but you have to do, Maybe you get a better job. Maybe you can better serve your country. Maybe you can make some contribution to the world. Maybe you'll just be a better, well-rounded individual who's more willing to, uh, more able to effectively engage in being a citizen. Maybe you're learning to stand for what you believe in so that you can stand up against you know, bullying or tyranny or whatever it is that you see in the world that you need to stand for. Education has all of these values, and we all know that. There are very few people in the world who say, you know what we should really get rid of? School. I mean, except for teenagers. Most of us realize that even though it's hard work and it's not all that much fun sometimes, that it's a good thing to engage in. It's an okay thing to be excited about even. It's laudable to do well at it. It's even a holy vocation from the perspective of the church. We would say that this is a holy thing that we're engaged in. So isn't it interesting that we acknowledge that the hard work that goes into that, the suffering that goes into that, we see the uh, positive advantages. We see the long-term effects, and we realize, hey, this is, this is going to be okay. We should do this anyway. But when we see suffering in other parts of our lives, we recoil in horror as if we've never seen anything like that before. And worse yet, we get awfully judgmental. So that people who, for example, are struggling not with you know, vector mathematics, but are instead struggling with something like finances? Maybe they're barely making ends meet? We start wondering, is it even worth the struggle? And the people around them, and, and you and I can do this sometimes, even if we know better, will look at this and say, you know what? Maybe these people deserve this. Or we'll observe on the outside what people who are struggling with their finances choose to spend their money on, and we'll say, that's not what they should do as if we know what that's like, or as if we remember when we do kn did know what it was like, what we did. And we say th things like the poor are lazy or undeserving of help, or they need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, which always makes me laugh, because the idea is literally the idea of grabbing a hold of your bo bootstraps and trying to levitate. Like, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps was never a compliment. It just got sort of, somebody didn't get the joke, and began using it like it was serious, and now everybody's like, well, he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. <laughs> right. Or we look at people who are struggling with relationships, and we think, man, if you're struggling with a relationship, you're doing something. Somebody's got to be wrong. Somebody's got to be doing something wrong. I think this is my last graph, I promise. <laughs> but I like this because... Um, it, what worries me is people who are like, oh, we're in love, we're going to get married. And I said, okay, when's the first time, you know, how long has it been since your uh, fight, your last fight? And they say, oh, we never fight. You're not ready. That's scary to me. Not because I want them to fail or I want them to fight, but just because fighting happens. And I like this graph because it, it starts off over time, right? Feelings of love up and down, time left to right, and it starts out and you get the honeymoon phase and everything feels wonderful. We talked about this last week, this is limerence. Oh, Will you be my limerent object? It's not really love, but it feels just like it. Actually, it feels better than that. And then you get on here, and, and you have your first fight, and you make up, and then another fight, and you make up, until you get to this, you know, through the continual bicker bickering and quarreling stage until you settle out on something that is constant and steady. I thought that was kind of a nice illustration of what a real relationship usually looks like, at least. 
So in some ways, suffering is something that we know produces good things. Suffer your way through school, you'll get a better job, you'll have a better career, you'll be a well, more well-rounded person, you'll make more friends, and you'll probably earn more money. Except if you become a pastor, then you'll spend a lot on a graduate education and be a pastor. That's a joke. Sort of. <laughs> but in other areas, struggle, struggle that we don't respect. Because things are supposed to keep getting better. So we're going to be reading two passages today. They're short. They're from, uh, the first one's from the book of, the book of Pastor, adjust your microphone, please. The first, first one's from the book of James, chapter 1. And so you can follow along if you want to go to sog.church slash Bible, or you can just follow along on the screen here. But James starts off, and this is really early. This is the second verse in the letter. It basically says, to my friends. And then he begins, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. James is smoking crack. <laughs> whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. But I think it's actually got some truth to it. We're going to keep going through this. But if your first reaction is mine, which is really considering nothing but joy, then you're, you're in the right place. <laughs> Consider it nothing but joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's stop there. What he's saying here is that you can find joy in suffering situations when you realize that your faith being tested is producing endurance. It is producing in you the ability to persevere when things get hard. Suffering becomes a training ground for how we relate to every other difficulty in our life. It's as if you're going to compare Jennifer swimming in a pool with me swimming in a pool. Jennifer has suffered. Jennifer is one of the best swimmers I know. She is awesome. She went to the pool uh, a couple days ago, and she swam 59 laps, which is what, like almost two miles, something like that, or a little more? Yeah, but not much less. Yeah, that's like she does that for fun, and we're having her treated for mental illness later. Um, so if you put... Her in the pool, who has suffered through miles and miles and miles of swimming for years, and you put me in the pool, and the only reason why I don't drown is because I'm fat. <laughs> the person who's going to be able to have endurance is her and not me, because I haven't put in the effort. And I also don't care to. I don't enjoy it. Drowning is not my favorite thing. But endurance... Suffering produces endurance. And if you endure things and you know what it is to suffer and you know what it is to have things not always go your way, it produces character. He calls that that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing. In other words, that you may be a whole person and that your faith would have a, you'd have a whole faith in God. <coughs> not just a fair weather faith. Now, I know what it is. To, I know what fair weather faith is and I know what it is to be a fair weather fan, Right? Some of you are Huskers fan to the core, and when things were really dark and we were losing every game, you stuck with them, <coughs> even though you had no reason to, because you're from Nebraska, and that's what you do. But you know that there were people who did not pay attention to the Huskers when they were not winning, right? And some of you are brave enough or stupid enough to raise your hands in this room right now, and I didn't ask you to. <laughs> but let's face it. Let's face it, that the completion of that is to say, I'm not going to be a fair weather faith person. I am going to, the endurance is going to produce maturity and complete faith that trusts God in every situation. I'm not going to be a fair weather fan of God. I'm going to be fully committed so that when things are going well, when I'm happy at church, when I'm doing, you know, when I feel like God is really looking out for me, when I feel like God is really present and helping me, I'm going to be there. But I'm not going to regard God as having abandoned me when I go through something awful. There's a big difference there. Let's keep going. So that's James. We're going to go on to verse 5. And he throws in this little bit here, which I think is, is valuable. He says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. 
He talks about trials of any kind. And what he's saying here is because of the trials of the world, you can produ- it produces endurance, and that produces maturity. And I don't know about you, but when I see, look out over my generation, I see a lot of people who can shave, a lot of men especially, who I call boys who can shave. Because they've got the ability to grow facial hair, but somewhere along the lines, they didn't get the ability to make mature decisions. Boys who can shave need to learn to grow up. And they need to go through something that's challenging. That's why I think the military is a good option for some guys. So when you face something difficult, like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, right? You must leap from the lion's head. You want me to do what? He didn't have a whole lot of faith. He grabbed a bunch of gravel and threw it on the invisible path, right? But when you face something that tests your faith, it grows you when you don't want to grow when you wouldn't have chosen that, when you wouldn't have put in the activation energy, you're going to grow anyway. The diagnosis, for example, that, that means that you are facing a lifespan that's shortened or you don't know what the future holds. When you face that situation, the promises of God come into sharper focus than maybe they ever have been for you because you really have to trust resurrection then when you know when your life's end is coming. Or the uncertain future. For our graduates today that are moving on past graduation and into adult life, you are taking a step into the unknown. And as you do that step into the unknown, it takes faith. And when you make that step into the unknown, you grow as an adult human being. Or you find that the struggle of working out what life together means for a couple when you're trying to figure out what it means to blend two lives together that have gotten used to doing things the way that they do them on their own terms. Or maybe parents, the trepidation of watching your grown children step out into the world on their own and hoping that you've done enough. All of these trials, hopefully, bring us endurance, completion of faith, and maturity. But, you know, our attitude really makes a difference in this. And our attitude is really rooted in our faith. Because while God is not the author of the evil things that happen around us, when somebody gets cancer, it's not because God wanted them to have cancer. It's because the world is broken. Because the genomes that we have that make us who we are uh, get messed up. It's a result of the sin and fallenness of this world. It's not God decided, you know what? I really think you deserve cancer. Let's just see what you do with this curveball. That's not how it works. But God can bring good out of the worst of situations. When Jennifer and I, and I, we've shared this story very widely, but when we were dealing with Jennifer's uh, health concern, we didn't know what was going on with her. It wasn't a good thing that Jennifer was facing these extremely fair, r- rare forms of migraines. It was a bad thing, an evil thing. It was awful. It was awful for her especially, but it was awful even for me to watch her go through that. But when we came through the other side of it, we came through it stronger because God used it for God's purposes. He didn't create it, but he used it. The testing of our faith is a way in which we grow. God does allow trials to happen to us in this world. It seems to be built in. It seems to be built into the very nature that you can make decisions. And you can make decisions that are good decisions or bad decisions. I used to be a software developer. So I'm sort of totally a geek. Okay? (laughs) Now, you all probably have a hate-hate relationship with software developers because you have to deal with their crap when they ship it. Okay, like your software on your phone or whatever app you're using or whatever, right? Okay, what do we call it when it doesn't work right? Broken, yeah, okay. But what's what's the word that we use for it? It's a computer software bug or glitch, right? We all know what it is to interact with a bug or a glitch. Every one of those bugs or glitches was done by a person, a person like me with feelings. But here's the thing. Sometimes bugs and glitches make the software better. Unintended coding makes things better. And I kind of struggle to come up with an, a good example of this, but, but sometimes you know, things happen unexpectedly and it doesn't follow the spec, but you actually like it better. And you say, you know what, that's actually not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> it's a way of explaining something that you didn't have planned. The other way is, uh, that I like to say it is, I love it when a plan works out, as if I actually had a plan. 
The hidden feature of this world is that even though it's fallen, even though it's broken, even though for all intents and purposes, if we look out with natural eyes at the world around us, we see no reason for hope and every reason for despair. Nevertheless, the hidden feature of this world is that if you go through it, God will use it. It won't be fun, and you might not, you know, that's, that's the thing about life, you might not make it out alive. But you will grow. And God is much more concerned with who we're becoming than how happy we are about it. I've often wondered what it is that makes some 25-year-olds incredible adults. People who can just adult really well. And I've got, I know some 55-year-olds who are toddlers. Who are, mature, in, in terms of maturity, they are toddlers. They throw tantrums. What's the difference between the 25-year-old who's learned maturity and the 55-year-old or 65 or 75, whatever, the older person who hasn't learned that maturity? It's the attitude that they've had towards suffering. Those who think, I faced the suffering, I beat the suffering down, and I went through the suffering, and it's all about me and what I've done, those are the people who have this sense of entitlement that causes them to throw three-year-old tantrums when they're 53. And the people who realize that what they have is gift and promise, and they look at the world and they say, I didn't make it through by my own ability, but by the ability of, uh, you know, by the work of God in my life with the people around me. That's maturity in a way that can, is really unequal. Those are the towers of faith that, you know, if you, you look at them at 25 or 30 or 35 years old and you say, when they're 75, like, I'm just going to want to sit at their feet and listen because they've had that, those lenses on their whole life. The difference seems to be the effect that they've allowed trials of faith to have upon their life? Do they regard them as something that they should whine and complain about or something that they should take on and deal with, but will do it with the help of God? And that makes all the difference. Because God ultimately wants all of us to develop character. And character gives us endurance. When the relationship is hard, when we disagree, when our feelings have grown cold, when we wake up and we look over at the other person, which is something that has never happened to me, but when you look over at the other person and think, oh my God, I'm married to that person. This has happened to Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> when, that, when that experience hits you, you can rely on the endurance and the maturity and the completeness of faith that's prepared to address a world full of challenge. Endurance produces spiritual fruit. Romans chapter 12, and we won't dwell on this long, but I think it's a good way to sum up the way that we ought to address the difficulties and challenges of this life. Starting at verse 9, he says, Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Notice it starts off with, with feelings and, and dispositions. You know, love, hate, hold fast, love one another, affection, outdoing one another and showing honor, starting to turn towards action. And so uh, the, the direction, the spiritual direction of this from turning towards, from your affect and the way you relate to the world to your outward action. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. What he's saying is the way that we do our inner world changes how we do our outer world. And all of that comes from the patience and the perseverance that grows character when we face suffering. When we focus on doing life together, struggling together, working together, growing together, and whether that's something that we're facing in our family as we have a loved one departing for, for new things, or if that's something we're dealing with in a relationship, whether you're dating or you're married or you're really struggling, wherever you're coming to this from, we can be confident then in the promise that God gives us that we can be sure to receive from God that when we put Jesus Christ in the center of our relationships, we don't get perfect marriages, we don't get perfect relationships, and we certainly don't get perfect, stress-free, pain-free, hedonistic paradises. These things don't happen. But what does happen is that if we put these things in the hands of a God who cares about us, loves us, 
died on the cross for us, sacrificed for us, we can be confident that we will receive his presence because the God who, goes, who went to the cross and suffered and died on the cross is also the God who goes with us into our suffering and who walks with us as we bear our crosses. The God who knew of his purpose and was willing to work for that, even going into the depths of Jerusalem, knowing that death was at the end, can give us the purpose of being open to new possibilities that we never would have anticipated. The God whose power is not made perfect in displays of strength and military might, but whose God is made perf- or whose power is made perfect in the weakness of a human being dying a torturous, innocent death. That power which sacrifices for the love of another can come into our hearts and change the way that we relate to people. My prayer for you is this, that faith in that God, not the God of good feelings and good times, but the God of a complete and total faith in fair weather and in foul, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, that God might walk through with you through every challenge so that you will find the strength and character and endurance to go the distance. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to thank you for coming and, and joining us for worship here at Spirit of Grace today. I'd, uh, at this time, I'd like you to get your bulletins out. Um, we've come to that point in the service. If you didn't manage to get a bulletin on the way in, um, there's no shame in that. Just raise your hand. Uh, also, if you need something to write with, that'll be an important part of the next process here. So if you'll raise your hand and let us know that you need a bulletin or something to write with, a member of our First Impressions team will be hop to it and bring you what you need. We will start off on the front of our bulletin with our couple that is getting along so very politely. Uh, down at the bottom, it says response card. If you would let us know that you are here today to share this experience, we would greatly appreciate that. And as you get to the uh, bottom of the second column, it's going to ask you service attended today. Just circle 1033. And then you flip it over to the back. I've got a couple of things to show you here. There's a couple of announcements here on the back of the bulletin. I invite you to take this home with you and look it over. Um, the big one I want to highlight, though, is that the year-end party for the Sanctuary Youth Service uh, will be this coming Wednesday. So they're done with the worship piece, but they're not done done because I want to have them come and have some fun with us Wednesday night at 7 until 8.30. Bring a friend, a snack to share, and optionally a board game. Down at the bottom of this part of the bulletin, I've got a question for you to consider. And what we do here uh, at Spirit of Grace is we ask people to think about this, write down an answer, and then take the top portion of the bulletin home with you and put it someplace where you'll have that as a reminder. Um, t- this week I'm asking you to consider this question. This week, I will encourage this person or this couple that are going through a hard time. My guess is that that brings somebody to mind for most of us. Somebody who's having trouble, whether that's spiritually, emotionally, financially. um, How can you be encouraging? Then below the fold, I have a couple other questions for you. First of all, if we can pray for you in any way. Please let us know. Check the box if you'd like that kept private just to me and the private prayer team. And then over here on the other side, our response card question today is this. The greatest lesson I ever learned from enduring a bad situation is what? And if you would be willing, we'll keep this private. It's not going to be broadcast from the mountaintops or anything. But if you'd be willing to share with us what you've learned from enduring suffering or enduring a bad situation, I'd be honored to read that. While you do that, I do want to let you know about um, a couple things that are coming up. And I don't know what my first slide is, Eric, so just put it up there. Let's see it. I think it might be our video. Yes.
So our summer stretch is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, sometimes churches talk about the summer slump. I've been very grateful that that's not really ever, really ever been a thing for us at Spirit of Grace because uh, we know that uh, disciples of Jesus don't take vacation. Um, <laughs> you know, what happens in Vegas does not just stay in Vegas. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and so I would encourage you to uh, join us next week because we're going to be talking about a way to, you know, we're going to be enjoying our, our time together and we're going to be talking about ways that we can stretch ourselves a little bit in terms of our spiritual growth uh, and to let this summer be a time uh, for getting more than just a good tan. So please join us if you're going to be in town. We would love to have you here at Spirit of Grace. Um, also, I want to let you know about Power Up, which is coming um, next Sunday also. So it's a big Sunday for us next Sunday. Uh, Power Up is our new uh, unit for Spirit Kids, which is our children's uh, worship service uh, that's happening actually right now as we speak downstairs. And so they've been wrapping up Big Questions, the game show uh, theme for the last eight weeks or so with a little break for Easter. Now we're going to be eight weeks in Power Up. We're going to be talking about video games. Um, and we like to describe this as... Uh, a worship service and Sunday school and vacation Bible school uh, amped up and then cr condensed into an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes a week, uh, year round. So we don't take a break on this for the summer, um, and, and we, just, we just really value what happens down there because our kids really learn the faith at their level. So if you've got kids or you know people with kids who are going to be uh, interested in something like that, it's for ages 4 through 5th grade. Uh, we will have invitation cards that we'll be distributing for both those new things that are coming up next week as you leave today. When you have finished with your response card, please tear it off the bottom of your bulletin. And then you can fold that over and return it in the offering when we collect that in a few minutes here. Please join me in a word of prayer. Life-giving God, we thank you for your presence with us in, even in the midst of suffering. We thank you that even when Life is challenging and difficult and painful, maybe even especially at those moments, Lord. We can know that you are there. You did not regard suffering as something to be avoided. You did not regard the pain of the cross as something that was not worth the growth of life and love and the promise of eternal salvation that comes to us through it. And so we pray that that same attitude of love and of willingness to bear suffering, of looking for the way in which our character grows and, and looking for ways to sacrifice for the other, inhabits our lives, our families, our workplaces, and most of all, Lord, our, our romantic relationships. Help us to be bearers of that good word to all of the people we encounter. And remind us, Lord, that our true joy, our lasting peace, and our real power does not come by any effort of our own, but through your innocent suffering and death and your glorious resurrection. Help us, Lord, to trust you in fair weather and foul, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, till death do us part. In Jesus' name, amen.